All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Kara Circle. Kara Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Kara's Books. And Kara's Books is normally the space where we gather together to celebrate books like this. But uh, I'm coming to you live from my office in my home. And I'm here with Susan Douglas, who's coming to us live from her home um, in Michigan. And um, we're really excited to get to have these conversations, even though they are socially distanced. Um, tonight's event is co-sponsored by our friends at the Lola. Um, we're going to be throughout the night sharing some links to the Lola so that if you're not familiar with what the Lola is about, you can get familiar. They're going to be co-sponsoring several events with us over the next few weeks and over the next uh, many years, we hope so. But this is the first one and we're really excited to have them with us tonight. Um, we, we invited them to join us because um, their mission is very aligned in terms of thinking about women's power and thinking about how we build um, a block uh, as, you know, a, a voting block, a political block, a, a power um, to move forward and change our culture in all spheres. So my guest tonight is Susan Douglas. Susan is the Catherine Nefi Kellogg Professor of Communication and Media at the University of Michigan. She's the author of numerous books of feminist cultural and media studies, including Where the Girls Are, The Rise of Enlightened Sexism, The Mommy Myth, and now the book we are ce celebrated tonight, In Our Prime, How Older Women Are Reinventing the Road Ahead. So please welcome Susan Douglas. We're gonna ask you to please put your questions down in the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to chat with one another. If you see people that you, uh, that you know uh, in the chat, you can, you can say hello back and forth. You can put questions there too. And um, Susan's gonna read for a little bit, talk about the framing of the book, the argument of the book, and then we're gonna, have, uh, we're gonna open it up for questions. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here, Susan. Well, thank you so much for having me, ER. It's a, a, a great pleasure to be here. And, and um, thank you to Lola. And uh, I want to give a shout out to my longtime childhood friend, uh, Sherry Pulaski Mole, who put me and ER together to make this event happen. So, what I'm going to do is read a little bit, maybe 10 minutes. I don't want to read too long. Um, and then I'm going to uh, answer my own questions about things like why did I write the book and what did I find? I'm going to lay out the structure of the book and, and what I found. Um, and then I'm just going to um, open it up for uh, questions from you all. So um, I wanted to have um, much of this be a little bit more of an informal presentation on my part rather than reading because I mean, reading after a while can be for a long time can be a little narcotizing in person and it can be even worse online. So I'm just going to read from the introduction of the book to give you a sense of the open of it. And then I'll talk more informally and then um, off we go. And I have to put my glasses on because I can't read without them. Um, so I know there'll be a little bit of a glare, but uh, I hope you guys can put up with it. Okay. I am a baby boomer and thus a woman, as we would say politely, of a certain age. And as I blink my eyes and wonder, as so many of us do these days, how did I get here? I am feeling once settled tectonic plates rumbling beneath our feet, changing what it means to be an older woman in America. They are especially shifting about what older women want and how we see ourselves, while not yet widely noticed, given everything else on our nation's overcrowded and ever hyperventilating screens, it is an impending and major upheaval in our cultural terrain. Now, on the one hand, our culture seems intent on trying to rope women of my vintage off into a honey-hued, quiet, quilted preserve where we are as relevant and as stimulating as pet rocks. All too many drug ads on television, for example, suggest we are supposed to go plant peonies and play peekaboo with our grandchildren, unless you're as beautiful and famous as Helen Mirren or Susan Sarandon uh, and can be commissioned to be the face of a skin cream company. We're also supposed to keep quiet about and ignore the muscular efforts by the mostly white haired men our age or older to reverse so many of the gains women of our generation achieved. On the other hand, 
the ropes are giving way because the numbers are adding up. There are more women over 50 in, than ever before in our country. And millions of us are not pottering in the garden or inclined to say, okay, whatever, to the trashing of our legacy, the mowing down of women's rights, the marginalizing of our generation, what we have accomplished and who we are. So I see this as a major turnstile moment in our culture and in our history. I mean, look around. Women over 50 and well beyond are everywhere. Well, <laughs> this is true before COVID-19 ravaged the land. Working, shopping, traveling, going to concerts, yoga studios, restaurants and bars, and importantly, working to get more women elected to public office as well as serving in public office themselves. Many feel that they are in their prime. And the 2018 New York City Marathon, 88 people, 88 people over the age of 75 competed, including 70 women in their 70s and 80s. Millions of us are more confident, more financially independent, more socially engaged, and more outspoken than our mothers were at this age, or even than some of us were uh, in our 20s. And we are dramatically changing how these years are lived and how they are experienced. The number of older women today doing jobs that in 1970 were reserved primarily or only for men is unprecedented. And our accomplishments have given us self-confidence, even power, and for some, money. Yet still, all too many businesses, political leaders, and certainly the media have put their blinders on when it comes to us. They do so because older women are supposed to be, for the most part, and even more so than younger women, quiet, docile, invisible. Even feminism, which would not have happened in the 1970s without so many of us, and which is enjoying a much needed and at times fiery resurgence, is cast in the media primarily as a young woman's game with its high profile embrace of Beyonce, Lena Dunham, Dunham Emma Watson, and other celebrities, and with the explosion of the Me Too movement across our nation in 2017. The battle over Brett Kavanaugh's Supreme Court nomination provoked women's open wounded fury over so many male Republicans dismissive attitudes towards sexual assault in particular and women in general. Like a sensational discovery of intact mastodon bones, many girls and women of all ages are seeing starkly how sexism and patriarchy still structure our society, our politics, and our culture at their very core. And this nearly 50 years after the women's movement. Feminist writers like Rebecca Traister and Brittany Cooper have written and spoken passionately about the current pressing need for women's rage. And in the 2018 midterms, a record 117 women were elected to Congress, the vast majority of them in opposition to the throwbacks, politics of misogyny. Women like me are standing up and cheering about this renewed feminist tsunami. Sorry. Feminism backed by popular demand was a recurring sign at the 2017 Women's March. According to a 2016 Washington Post poll, 68% of women aged 50 to 64 and 58% of women over 65 identified as feminists or strong feminists with majorities finding feminism empowering. Yet the voices, concerns, and interests of older women have gotten minimal attention as part of this new revitalized feminist movement. We've been sidelined, at least in media imagery and in political discourse. Even worse, we have at times been cast by some as outdated, clueless antagonists to younger women, fuddy-duddy, second-wave feminists stuck in the past, with second-wave even becoming an insult, 
and stereotyped as, and I'm quoting here, hidebound relics who are too timid to push for the real revolution, end quote. As entertainment riot, writer Laura Hudson lectured in a tweet, it was time for older feminists, quote, to listen, to learn, to step aside, because age tends to correlate with not being on board with progress, end quote. But here we are, hugging young women's concerns close to our hearts and hugging our own as well. So there is something quite incongruous here between our flesh and blood visibility in everyday life, the vitality of our past and our present, our ongoing feminist concerns and energy, and our invisibility or dismissal in too many sectors of our country's cultural imagination. According to one survey, the majority of older women uh, believe that if the media were reflective of the population, a person would likely suppose that women over 50 do not exist. Not surprisingly, 91% believed it is about time for society to change the way it looks at aging, especially for women. This near total eclipse is even more obscuring for older women of color who are virtually absent from the screens of America. So the question before us is this, are we going to accept this manufactured invisibility or are we going to rip off the invisibility cloak? Many increasingly impatient women are saying, let's choose option B. To do so, we need to confront our medias, our cultures, and our own dismissive attitudes about aging, especially for women, and how they seek to marginalize and silence us culturally, economically, and politically. And we need to do so with humor, irreverence, and yes, anger. So I'm gonna stop reading there, and I'm going to tell you some of the questions I've been asked about the book and answer them <laughs> and, um, and then lay out uh, the structure of the book and maybe read a tiny bit more and then open it up. Okay. Um, okay. So why did I write this book? So um, uh, as, as ER noted in the intro, um, I've written several books about the representation of women in the media, and they've all been somewhat semi-autobiographical. Where the girls are was about what um, baby boom women confronted in the media as we were growing up. And I drew uh, both from extensive archival uh, research about what was going on in the media at the time, but also, you know, from my own experiences of watching everything from Bewitched to Charlie's Angels, um, to the way the news media covered the women's movement um, and the ERA and so on and so forth. Um, my next uh, book on women in the media um, was called The Mommy Myth. And yeah, I, I had had a child <laughs> and I was really... Um, feeling very oppressed by the incessant images of perfect motherhood that at the time um, in the late 80s and the 90s were bombarding me from pretty much every magazine cover where there were these perfect celebrity moms talking about their miracle babies and everything they did to ensure that their kids would be like Nobel laureates by the time they were 12. And at the same time, bookended with that was the horrific demonization of mothers of color, uh, both through the so-called crack e epidemic, which was a media invention and made up, and through the demonization of welfare mothers. Um, and then, you know, I did Enlightened Sexism, and that was inspired in part by, again, changes I was seeing in the media and what was being laid forth before me. But by then, my daughter was a teenager. And, you know, she would turn on MTV and there were these just appalling like um, beach party things on MTV where young women were supposed to bare their breasts for like some guy named Diesel and his best friend Joe. And, you know, so <laughs> again, it was autobiographical in, in that way, watching what my daughter was confronted with when she was growing up. 
Well, you know, by the 20 teens, um, I had become a woman of a certain age and I wanted to explore and write about how older women were represented. Where were we? What kind of roles did we have in the media? What, uh, did we appear as experts or newscasters or whatever? And um, so I began looking at that. And um, here's what I found. So on the one hand, of course, I found rampant gendered ageism and invisibility. Um, I'll just give you a few examples. I don't know if you remember this insurance uh, ad from 2014, where there was a 70 something woman named Beatrice who was with her equally aged friends. And she was bragging to them about, oh, now, you know, I don't have to send out and mail out all my photos from my vacation. I can put them up on my wall. And the camera cuts to her scotch taping her vacation pictures on her wall, as if women are as dumb as box turtles when it comes to Facebook, right? It was a totally ageist ad. Um, there was another skit on SNL. It was very funny. It was um, in 2017, and it was about a new product called Alexa Silver. And it was Alexa for older people. Uh, and the whole skit was about how older people couldn't hear. Uh, they always lost their phones. They were freezing. Um, they didn't listen, etc. And there were aspects, uh, again, of the skit that were funny, but it was also totally ageist. Um, if you look at television, men in their 70s, even in their early 80s, and this is particularly true on CBS, but not only, they get to continue to anchor and report the news, whereas women of the same age um, are shunted off to radio or uh, have to quit entirely. Uh, it's become a cliche that men in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, including as romantic leads, are paired with women in their 30s. Um, and, you know, that men get to be dignified when they're older because their temple's gray and women don't. Um, so, you know, th there was certainly plenty to work with around gendered ageism in the media and in our culture. Um, and certainly if one read some of the absolutely horrific things that were said uh, by Trump supporters about Hillary Clinton, that she was a tired up old hag and everything else during 2016, when she was a year younger than he is. Um, so there was plenty of that. But at the same time, I started noticing something different, both in the media um, and in everyday life. Um, Older women were, were everywhere. You know, uh, I used to fly a lot before all of this. Older women were in the airports. They were shopping. When you go to the mall, um, you know, now most malls are on life support. But when you'd go to the mall, all the shops were like for 20-something, uh, you know, kids. What were the older women doing? They were <laughs> race walking around the mall. Um, so older women, everyday women were out and about, they were staying in their jobs. In fact, 33% um, of women 65 to 70 are still working and 17% of women 70 to 75 are still working. Some because they love their jobs and don't want to quit and some uh, because they have to. Um, so there are more women out there in the real world, all around us, in our communities, in our religious uh, institutions, uh, in workplaces and the like. And at the same time, um, we were starting to see more older women, um, celebrities breaking out. You had um, Bette Midler opening um, at the age of 70 or 71, Hello Dolly in New York, Sally Field on Broadway. Uh, you had Helen Mirren and Judy Dench and uh, Meryl Streep and Diane Keaton uh, opening movies. You had Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin um, in Grace and Frankie. There were these older, um, influential, powerful female uh, actors and um, musicians refusing to be put out to pasture. Now, not all of them 
uh, not all older actresses had this kind of clout, but enough did so that you started seeing uh, more women on the screens of America. So I really wanted to dig deeper into this um, and, and think about this turnstile moment, this moment where on the one hand, invisibility and dismissal still exists, but that different kinds of women are pushing for visibility and pushing for legitimacy. And of course, you know, who's the, who's the one who's really taken on Donald Trump? It's Nancy Pelosi and Maxine Waters. So, um, so I do think we're at a very interesting turnstile moment where older women, famous or not, are saying enough. Um, so what I wanted to do is look at how older women were represented in the media. And I also wanted to reclaim our legacy as baby boom women. And we all know, you know, generations are um, horribly stereotyped and, you know, 72 million baby boomers all lumped into certain categories. The same thing is happening with the poor millennials. Um, and, you know, baby boomers have been disparaged nonstop. But, you know, baby boom women changed America. And we need to honor and retrieve and get inspiration from what we accomplished in the 70s and 80s and beyond. So, um, let me talk a little bit about the structure of the book, um, and then I might read one more thing, and then I'm just happy to open it up because I think these things are better when people go back and forth and you're not listening to me the whole time. So um, the first chapter is called Women is Coming of Age, which just lays out the main premises of the book, and I read some of that to you um, earlier. The next chapter is called Why the 70s Mattered, and I really you know, there's such an amnesia um, and many young women don't even know, um, you know, what women accomplished in the 1970s and 80s. Um, it's not taught much anymore. It's been erased in our media and it's a, it's a rich, important history. And so one of the things I wanted to do is really lay out what feminists accomplish. And by the way, not just white, famous, you know, media famous uh, feminists. Um, but the other person I, whose legacy I really wanted to resurrect was Maggie Kuhn. Maggie Kuhn, who hardly anybody knows who she is today. Um, Maggie Kuhn was the founder of the Great Panthers, and she became hugely famous in the 1970s and 1980s. She traveled all over the country, giving hundreds and hundreds of lectures uh, a year. Um, she was designated one of the top most influential women in the country. And basically what she was combating was ageism. And um, so I, it was a, a great pleasure to write about her. I mean, she went on the Johnny Carson show several times and uh, busted him about doing, for those of you old enough to remember this, his Aunt Blabby routine. Um, so I really wanted to bring her forward because I see her as an inspiration for all of us. Um, the next chapter is called The Rise of Aspirational Aging. And I kind of had fun with this one. Um, and and um, let me tell you what um, aspirational, what I mean by aspirational aging, and then just give you some examples. Um, aspirational aging is, um, you know, one media response to our demographic revolution that I just talked about but it envisions getting older as a life stage of throbbing empowerment and privilege. Aspirational aging is a media crafted, marketing created zeitgeist whose central tenets are self-actualization, the ongoing importance of personal proactive transformation, um, the developing, developing of another new potential self to ward off and pretend we aren't aging. It draws from over a decade of market research, some of it silly and some of it on the mark, about how baby boomers see themselves at, as very different from the retirees of yore and the stereotypes that encase them. Aspirational aging does recognize that many older people are active in the world, feel younger than their age, and hate age stereotypes. But then it seeks to exploit these positive, sensibilities in ways that can commodify and distort what we need 
and how we are supposed to see ourselves. And so um, the thing about aspirational aging, of course, it's welcome, you know, when the AARP magazine or whatever, you know, t celebrates older people and what they're doing. They're mostly um, wealthy, privileged celebrities. Um, and the other place you see this, of course, for those of you who watch any of the cable news channels or the weather channel, um, it's the endless bombardment of, um, you know, big pharma ads. And we're the only country besides New Zealand that allows direct to consumer advertising for prescription drugs. Um, I personally think it should never been allowed and it should be illegal. Of course, if that happened, the budgets of um, CNN and Fox and MSNBC and, you know, the, the network nightly news shows would collapse. But if you look at some of these ads, they continue to equate age. And so they show you like the men are kayaking, the men are playing guitar, the women are inspecting Radicchio and blowing bubbles with their kids. The gender stereotypes are rampant um, and they still equate aging with disease. Um, and some of these diseases you've like never heard of. Anyhow, um, that's that chapter. And I had a lot of fun with uh, the way in which this kind of aspiral, aspirational aging is sold because it's sold in the following way. Successful aging is an individual accomplishment. You don't need any help. You shouldn't need any help. The government shouldn't help. There shouldn't be any you know, corporate or business policies that help. It's all up to you. Just go to the gym more, you know, and take your omega-3 pills. And so uh, on the one hand, um, there's something very welcome about aspirational aging because it's about stereotypes. And on the other hand, there's something very insidious about it, about who can and deserves to age well and who doesn't. The next chapter I had so much fun with. Um, it's called the anti-aging industrial complex and it really starts out with a visit to sephora <laughs> and um it goes through oh these endless anti-aging products that we're all supposed to like go oh okay sure that works yeah um wait licorice you know makes your wrinkles go away um so that chapter is just for me kind of a romp through all of the bogus claims that a lot of these products make. Now, do I want to believe them? You bet I do, but they're bogus. And um, so I found some great websites that debunk a lot of this stuff and, um, and found some great um, lawsuits um, that sued some of these companies and also um, cease and desist orders by the FTC, which regulates advertising and the Food and Drug Administration that regulates products that busted a bunch of these companies for bogus anti-aging claims. You know, and, and at the end of the day, what are all these products selling us? They're telling us that we can stop an ineluctable biological process when I'm sorry, it'd be nice if we could do that, but it's not possible. And it also makes us hate, um, it urges us to hate our aging faces um, and our aging bodies when, you know, I earned this. Uh, I earned this a lot of good ways, maybe some bad ways, but you know, I think it's the mark of a well-lived and earnest life. Anyhow, I had fun with that one. Um, visit biz sorry, Visibility Revolts, the next chapter five, um, uh, really looks at the ways in which um, various celebrities in particular are seeking to defy stereotypes about older women. Um, and chapter six is called The War on Older Women. And this is much more of a policy chapter because when we um, hear about the efforts to um, gut or curtail Social Security, gut or curtail Medicare, it's never cast in gendered terms. And in fact, older women live longer than men. Older women have throughout their lives earned less money than men because their uh, pay was lower or they took time out to care for others. And um, they don't have the same Social, social Security as many men do. And um, so these efforts 
to gut the safety net. These are all a war on older women. And I really sought to lay that out and really um, eviscerate market fundamentalism. You know, this notion that, um, and of course we're seeing the ravages of this right now, the notion that the federal government, you know, should um, be shrunken, that the market is the best arbiter of the distribution of goods and services. I'm sorry, COVID-19 is exposing what a, a tragic lie that is. Um, and then the final chapter, which is uh, called Lifespan Feminism, Bridge Groups and the Road Ahead, lays out a bunch of to-dos about what we uh, as older women can do. Having said that, um, one of the things I'm really arguing against in this book is the notion that there's some uh, inherent um, animosity, uh, a war between younger women and older women. Uh, in my experience, that is totally false. The media love cat fights between different kinds of women uh, and especially between older women and younger women. And sure, are there some differences uh, between older feminists and younger feminists? Of course there are. We grew up in different times. Uh, we have different issues. Each generation has made uh, different discoveries and different mistakes, but we need to learn from each other. We need to hold hands with each other because right now we are fake facing some of the most rank misogyny and racism uh, that has been let loose in our country. And older women and younger women of all races and classes and sexualities, we have got to bridge with each other and um, to fight all of this. And so um, with lifespan feminism, I mean, one of the things I've found is that once women get to be a certain age, they're like seniors, but they're not feminists anymore. They're not folded into the feminist project. And we should be, I mean, feminism doesn't end when you're 50, you know? And so I think lifespan feminism really argues that feminism should be a mainstay and a resource throughout the entire arc of a woman's life. And to make that happen, feminists older and younger and um, of all hues and persuasions, we need to, um, you know, re really unite given um, what's facing us. So um, I think, you know, the, the message of the book is that it's a manifesto, it's a call to arms against gendered ageism, against invisibility. I want to reclaim women's aging as a social movement. I want to harness our voices for social change in concert and cooperation and mutual respect with our younger sisters. I want, want to point out that this isn't getting on the radar screens yet, but Older women are reinventing this stage of life. Look around you, you see it everywhere. Um, so the book is a call to action and it demands that we stop overlooking older women as key contributors to society. And I'm also asking us, and this is really hard because as baby boomers, you know, I and, you know, members of my generation, you know, we were raised on the beauty of youth and, slimness and everything else and that being old was ugly and you know we've got to stop internalizing these messages and we have to refuse to be discounted so i just want to say a couple of things given that um here we are uh in the midst of this pandemic um this horrible COVID 19. um what this has exposed is the rank, tragic inequality in our country. It has ripped it open and laid it open. Uh, it's laid it bare and we've got to uh, get together and fight against this. We're an, an enormous voting block of women and we need to have our voices heard. We need universal health care. That's what COVID-19 has shown. It's, it's opened up the health disparities along race and class lines. Um, we need paid sick leave. We need paid paternal leave, uh, parental leave, I'm sorry. Um, we need social security 
This went totally under the radar in the 2016 election. Hillary Clinton proposed that social uh, security benefits be expanded to compensate unca unpaired care workers when they left the job market to care for kids or aging parents, et cetera. Um, this was a great proposal. Um, we need to advocate for that. 66% of caregivers are women. Um, so those are just some of the things um, I'd like to call to action. And then I'll just read the last chapter. I'm, I'm sorry, not the last chapter, just the last paragraph. Um, and then I'll open it up and, um, you know, we can go back and forth. This is at the end of a bunch of recommendations that I make at the end of the book. Through all of this, talking back to gender, to ageism, and to make, uh, and to male political orthodoxy, building bridges with younger people, becoming more politically active and engaged, we can and will pick up where Maggie Kuhn left off and reinvent the road ahead. It's time for us everyday women to enact our own visibility revolts. Our coming of age is happening at a very distinctive moment when a resurgent feminism is crashing against a newly acceptable, even celebrated brew of racism, misogyny, and rank cruelty, along with homophobia and transphobia. Because there are so few media images out there of engaged, happy, gutsy older women who want to make the world a better place, we need to step into that role. Let's re reclaim aspirational aging from Big Pharma and other carnival barkers who equate it with blowing bubbles with grandchildren or mainly focusing on ourselves. Aspirational aging is about staking out our visibility in the world, being proud of and owning who we are and making that confidence contagious. Then younger women today will be even less tolerant of gendered ageism, less willing to comply with its exclusionary edicts than we are, especially if we blow wind in their sails. It is time individually and collectively to rip off the invisibility cloak. It's time to talk back. It's time to hold hands. Let's do it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I feel like that you offered us so much in there. So I want us to dig in and I want to invite folks now, if you've been listening at home to, to begin asking questions and I'll start to weave those in. Um, as you were talking, uh, particularly about aspirational aging, I was thinking about the, the, the sort of issue of collectivism versus individualism. And um, that so often we are, we in, in America in particular, given individualistic solutions to what are collective problems. Um, and I wondered as there's a stereotype now, obviously I am, I am a older millennial. I'm the first year of uh, in between millennial and Gen X. Uh, our, what we often sort of internalize as stereotypes about baby boomers is that it was the, a very individualistic generation of, you know, fulfill your own sense of self and your own purpose. But um, many of our great social movement tools, which are collectivist tools, also came from your generation. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that tension within your generation between collectivism and individualism. That's a great question. And, you know, I think, look, um, we were suspended between those two ideals, right? Absolutely. Because on the one hand, you know, as a young feminist, um, I, as an individual, <laughs> uh, did not want to put up with, you know, what I was being told as an individual, I could not do, of course. But um, I couldn't do that without the women's movement. And um, so uh, we, I, it's kind of hard to imagine this now. And, and I want to kind of come to where this got split apart. We held those two things in a, I think in a pretty harmonious suspension, you know, um, we went to moratoriums, you know, we protested the war collectively. We marched in the streets for women's rights collectively. Um, uh, you know, baby, 
the civil rights movement was, um, you know, enormously um, uh, magnified by baby boomers, black and white, right? Um, and we knew that collective action mattered. And, and I mean, if you, I know, you know, people look at pictures of Woodstock or, you know, hippie communes and they just like to make fun of them. Oh God, what, you know, idealistic, crazy, you know, drug induced people these were. But it was founded on a notion of communality and collectivism and that mattered to us. So um, what happened? <laughs> um, you know, in part, um, you know, the, the, the movements uh, fractured a bit. Um, they fractured, you know, people get tired. <laughs> and also, let's not forget COINTELPRO and all of the efforts to, you know, really infiltrate every single social movement there was and, and destroy it. Um, but by the 1980s, um, you had Reagan elected. And across the pond, Margaret Thatcher was elected. And they came in on uh, a new political philosophy that academics call neoliberalism. Um, and I did not use that. I think I use that word only once in my book because I think it's very confusing to people because that has nothing to do with liberalism at all. Yeah. Um, it's market fundamentalism, you know? And, um, you know, you had, he had the bully pulpit. Um, you had a right wing uh, uh, foundations, the Heritage Found Foundation, the Cato Institute, et cetera. They, they looked at what happened in the 60s and early 70s and the way in which the dominant discourse was, you know, uh, very much guided, not completely, but guided by these social movements. And so they founded these institutions that would infiltrate the media by putting out press releases and everything else. All of this is by way of saying that um, a new kind of rampant individualism was promoted. Um, and for, uh, I, I just speaking for women, it would, this was a tough time in the 1980s because listen, we'd accomplished a lot collectively, a lot. Um, I was doing stuff my mother couldn't even imagine doing, you know? Um, and so it, it, there was that, but then we were struggling also with some of our own individual uh, problems for which under Reagan, there were, uh, there were no collective solutions and there was an, a massive political so assault against, uh, you know, collective solutions. And so in some ways you were kind of forced to be every person on your own, you know? Um, and in some ways, you know, not to excuse us completely, um, there was a, an imperative, maybe even a seduction to that. But, you know, um, I still uh, remember watching, oh God, what was the Lawrence Kasdan movie? Um, the Big Chill? Yeah, The Big Chill. Um, and the acting was great, everything. That movie pissed me off so much <laughs> because it, on the one hand, yeah, you recognize some of it, but it wasn't, that wasn't how I was experienced experiencing things. So, you know, generations are multifaceted, multiracial, multi everything, right? And so, but one of the things that did happen, and then I'll stop, um, is there began to be in the 1980s, a whole um, journalistic literary industry, baby boom bashing. And I wrote about some of this in the book. Oh my God, column after column, selfish baby boomers. They were so narcissistic. They were these whiny babies, you know, in the 1960s. They didn't want to go to war. They didn't, you know, no, we didn't want to go to war. We didn't want <laughs> our daughters going to war. We didn't want our boyfriends going to war, our fathers going to war. No, we didn't to an immoral war. So, but there was a lot of this kind of stereotyping. Um, and you know, and so, um, and neoliberalism, boy, 
you know, I thought a stake was going to be driven into the heart of, of market fundamentalism in 2009 with the Great Recession. But nope, the Republicans were great, you know, on just keeping beating the drum. And my God, now when you see the desperate need for the federal government to be protecting people, to um, supplying them with information and services and money and food and everything. God, if we can't drive a stake in the heart of market fundamentalism now, I don't know if we're ever going to be able to. Um, but anyhow, that's a very long answer <laughs> to your question. Oh. But <laughs> it's but, a great answer, yeah. Um, but collectivism, I really, really think it is time for women to get together and um sure we're individuals and we have our individual aspirations we need to work together we need to revive that notion of collectivism one of the things so karis um is a very multi-generational space and i think um one of the things i see some of my uh friends on this who are watching who are in their 60s and 70s who are from karis and um one of the things that we've really worked to foster is the the lifespan feminism that you're calling for which is to say that it's really important to me that 80 year olds are sitting next to 18 year olds and that Absolutely. you know everyone is sharing ideas but one of the things that i have been struck with very poignantly at, at certain times that is like how painful it has been for some of my older friends to see particularly in the last five years or so all of this awful retrograde stuff coming back you know the threats to reproductive rights um you know misogyny coming out of the white house the violence um and the white supremacy that's on the rise all these things and my mother is 71 and talking to her about you know all of the revolutionary stuff that she did as a feminist in the 70s and 80s and then feeling like what did we what did we do all that for and so i wonder if you could talk a little bit about if you think mourning or mourning the losses uh, is necessary for whatever gets built after this, do you feel like in it, like pain needs to be worked through or anything like that? Hmm. It's an interesting question. Um, I think uh, anger is <laughs> what we need. I think anger is what we need. I mean, really, women want to go back to 1957. I don't think so, you know, no. Um, I think we need to be angry and, you know, Rebecca Traster's book, which I'm sure you have on your shelves, you know, um, uh, about the importance of women's anger. Um, she's argued the same thing. I, I think we need to look at this stuff and be really pissed off. And yes, it's painful to see what's happening. Um, but, you know, these people who are doing this stuff, they are not, I mean, the thing that is so crazy is the way in which gerrymandering and voter manipulation and everything else has made it the case that so many legislatures um, and our president who lost by 3 million votes, right, is not representative of public opinion in this country on a whole host of issues whole host of issues. Why did women, you know, what is it, 117 women, you know, win seats in Congress in 2018? You know what the big answer is? Health care. Health care. You know, people were freaked out that Obamacare was going to go away. But then there were a bun bunch of other issues as well. You know, paid parental leave, um, the violence of um, immigration practices where children being ripped away from their parents, on and on. And so um, I don't know if we need to mourn. I think we need to remind ourselves, what did we do? What did it take? What did we do? And we made mistakes. Of course we made mistakes, you know? And again, I'm speaking, I was not a, you know, I wasn't Gloria Steinem. I wasn't Bell Absig. I wasn't one of these leaders. Um, I was a leader with a little L, you know, not a big L, you know, um, and um, and mostly a follower, but a follower who embraced all of this stuff and um, and fought for it in my own little ways and my own little patches inspired by them. And, um, you know, so th there have there have been charges that the women's movement back then um, 
was too white. It was, uh, um, you know, racially exclusionary. It was homophobic, etc. Well, some of them were. I mean, Betty Friedan was notoriously homophobic. And she was freaked out that, you know, if lesbians got some kind of prominence in the movement, it would discredit the movement. But Gloria Steinem was, inter Gloria Steinem was intersectional before there was the word intersectional, you know. So we can't forget that. But I think we need to remind ourselves what we did. We changed the damn world, you know. Yeah. And um, we have huge obstacles ahead of us. Um, but... It's worth the fight. That's the other thing about feminism I think people forget. Um, it was fun. It was fun to fight against these jerks. It was fun to fight against these, you know, white men who thought they knew everything. And, you know, um, it was fun to talk back to male power. It, it was. <laughs> I have to ask if you're watching the Mrs. America television show on Hulu, which is about the ERA. Yeah, I haven't seen the whole thing. Something happened to my, to to Hulu. I saw like the first four episodes, and then I so I've got to pick up the next ones. But yeah, I have been watching it. Do you feel that it's an accurate representation of the times? I mean, I, I'm sure it's glammed up a bit, but I hate the wig that you know is on Gloria Steinem. Oh my god, <laughs> I do too. Oh, oh it's so terrible. Um, the wig is awful. And she didn't have curls at the end of her hair. So, you know, let's cut to the important substantive issue first, right? Um, but um, I do think it's pretty accurate. And, you know, the thing about Schlafly, um, whom we all came to hate with all our hearts, um, Schlafly was very shrewd, very shrewd. And she knew how to work the media. She was very smart at how to work the media. Um, and Kate Blanche is, is great as her. Um, so uh, let's see, who's who's playing Bella Abzug? Um, Margot Martindale? Yeah, yeah, she's very good. She's great as Bella Abzug. I mean, these are like women, you know, they were on television all the time. Um, and as Tracy Ullman, um, Betty Friedan, I'm like, mm. I mean, Tracy Ullman, I, who, who doesn't love her? Yeah. So I have beefs with this and that, but I think overall the way in which um, Schlafly snuck up on them, you know, and used the state levels to do this. Yeah, she was very smart, unfortunately. Well, in some ways I've been watching it and I don't want to spend too much time talking about it because I know not everybody has uh, gotten a chance to watch it or has Hulu, but I, um, I think it's really a good reminder of, uh, studying our enemy's tactics and, you know, at this moment using some of the tools that Schlafly used. Um, but for our side, you know, even at this moment of, you know, really getting back in at the, the very local level and, in, you know, building, building power back up, um, which I think people since, particularly since 2018 have been trying to do, trying to create pipelines of women's leadership in very local races so that, we have more opportunities at the state level and then at the federal level. Absolutely, I think 2018 was all about that. You mm -hmm. know, those women didn't get elected to Congress, you know, because of some fairy dust, you know, right? People yeah. went local, they went down ticket um, because the, there was monstrosity at the top. And so um, I think that has to happen again. I know that for me, um, I'm looking very much at state races now, um, which state races I want to contribute to, to try to flip the Senate. Um, but even, you know, in your own state, um, we have a lot to learn from Schlafly on that score. You're totally right. So I want to get some of our uh, viewer questions in here. Um, and I'm going to jump around a little bit um, because I think one of them is a good follow up. So Lorraine Fontana uh, is uh, a friend of ours from Karis, and she says, I'm also a wh white baby boomer woman, I'm 73, who saw how different my experience was from working class women of color. For example, as black womanists began to have their voices heard, I realized the racism still present among some white feminists was going to make it difficult to have a unified women's movement. How do you see those issues then and now? Um, I think that... Um well, I can't speak for all older women and 
I mean, I never could, right? But um, uh, I, I think I'm in a somewhat of a privileged position because I'm a college professor. And so I get to meet a lot of young women and meet them in class and hear what they're talking about. And so, um, you know, on the one hand, I do think that some of the racism and homophobia of the 1970s women's movement has been exaggerated. On the other hand, there was a lot of blindness there and it was there. And I think what's different now is that young women are advocating for uh, and teaching us um, the absolute importance of intersectionality, um, you know, across race, sexuality, class, disability, you know. And so we have a lot to learn from these smart, younger feminists uh, who are engaging along these lines. Um, so, you know, uh, mistakes were, they were blindnesses, mistakes were made. Some of them were conscious and some of them were just damn clueless and we can't afford to be clueless anymore. Yeah. Um, let's see. So uh, your, your sweet friend who um, made this event happen, Sherry Molly says, having grown up with you, I always knew that you'd do something wonderful with that brain of yours. What made you a feminist? Is the little town and the lives of our moms have anything to do with your choice? Oh, thanks, Sherry. I wish I could see you in person. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't have, looking back on it, um, I wouldn't have thought this at the time, but I think some of the stuff in our high school certainly made me be a feminist. I don't know what Sherry would think about this, but you know, there were these stupid dress codes and you know, you couldn't, uh, you know, your skirt had to be, you know, so long. And if it was too short, you had to kneel and the, you know, they'd take a ruler out and see if it was too short. And then you couldn't wear culottes. And after a while it was like, no, there was some stuff imposed on the guys, but it was really directed at the girls. And this, I found this really um, infuriating and got into fights with the principal and the associate principal about these issues, especially about the issues of cool. Like, what is the deal with culottes? You know, what is that? What's your problem? So there was that, um, you know, and what I would say about my own mother, who was, as Sherry knows all too well, a, a difficult person. <laughs> But, you know, my mother did rail against, um, you know, some of, uh, some of the inequities in her marriage and some of the inequities in the workplace and, um, you know, and, and, um, and some of the biases and snobberies, you know, in the, t in the town. So um, those did play a, a role, but I think, you know, what, what really made me a feminist was college and grad school. Um, I went to college, I went to a woman's college and in the um, middle of my freshman year, uh, we all got an announcement slipped under our doors that the college was going, this was in January, that the college was going co-ed in September. Well, by January, everybody's already put their college applications in. Anyhow, it was a completely botched thing, but, um, it was then announced, so we had curfews and we had something called parietals, which mean, meant that men could come into our room from like two to five on Sunday and, um, you know, and, you know, everybody's feet had to be on the floor. We had to wear skirts walking into town. There were all of these rules. And then when the guys were admitted, like they had no curfew, none of these rules applied to them. So we staged massive demonstrations. And our college president actually said, well, the difference is that guys can't go out and get knocked up and get pregnant. That was, yeah. Wow. So um, <laughs> I mean, he was the sucker pig. Um, anyhow, so, you know, you go through stuff like that. And then um, when I went to grad school, um, it was, I was in a very male dominated department and I'd go in to meet with male faculty members and they would ask me, um, what I was cooking for dinner. And um, I was like, okay, I'm never meeting with you again. And so, you know, it was such a 
um, fermenting period, that period from 70 to 74, and um, both experiencing this kind of rank um, discrimination against women and dismissal and sexism, and, you know, being a feisty Jersey girl, <laughs> I think, you know, those things conspired to make me a feminist. That's great. Um, do you, um, what do you think? So, I mean, you've said that the, the sort of tension between uh, feminists of different generations is greatly exaggerated. And I would totally agree with that. Um, I'm wondering, do you think there are any legitimate tensions there? And if so, what do you think they are? Um, you know, I, I'm not sure about the tensions around Me Too, because, you know, a lot was made that, um, you know, that older feminists were saying, oh, grow up, you know, this is what you have to put up with, we put up with it, blah, blah, blah. Which is like, not any older feminist I knew ever said that. <laughs> and that younger women were hypersensitive and, you know, feeling overly victimized. And so there was some stuff made around that but there was a Vox poll that showed that actually there was enormous consonance between what older women and younger women thought constituted sexual harassment and sexual misconduct. Um, and there was even consonance around concerns of some men, um, of Me Too going too far and some men being um, falsely accused, that there had to be, you know, a, um, you know reasonable, investigation, uh, you know, and I think this was in the wake of the Al Franken case. And, you know, many of us thought, okay, we don't know what happened. We let's, can we have an investigation here? Can Congress investigate and see if this guy really deserved to be hounded out of the Senate or not, you know, cause we didn't really know a lot. Um, you know, and stuff has come out subsequently about how some of this stuff was really manipulated and exaggerated. Um, anyhow, so the, the Vox poll showed that there were, um, there was a lot more commonality than there was difference around Me Too. Um, and I remember when the Aziz Ansari case happened and I had a, you know, I was teaching a seminar with 18 women at the time. And um, what they were really concerned about, I found this quite interesting, is that the way, for those, I'm assuming pe most people know about this, but you know, he went on a date with somebody and they became sexually involved. And after a while she said, okay, I want to stop. And so he stopped. Um, but in the intervening moments, there were some moments that where, you know, she later said she was uncomfortable and wished things had stopped. And so, um, then there was a lot of debate about should he have been a mind reader? Did he, or opposite, did he fail to really read her cues and, and really get consent and so on and so forth? And my students were like, I don't want to be seen as a victim. I don't want me to, to suggest that I'm always being a victim. It was just kind of an interesting, you know, so we had a long talk about that. So there's me too. I do think that for, um, you know, f I think one of the contests here between younger feminists and older feminists is how woke you are and who's the most woke, <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, and maybe we fall down on the job on that and maybe they're a little too, sensitive on that. I don't know. But really, for the most part, you know, you know, my daughter is a millennial. I'm friends with a lot of her friends and love them and think they're wonderful. I love my students. We have fantastic conversations. I don't feel a divide with them. Now, again, I inhabit a privileged space because I'm a teacher and I get to meet with, you know, see these women all the time. Um, but I do think sure there are going to be tensions and and ageism is out there look you know it is the most acceptable bias out there um you know with the possible exception of fat shaming you know uh, ageism is just 
it's misted into our entire society and culture. And so it wouldn't be surprising if younger women would um, not want to listen to or dismiss older women for that reason alone. But um, I, I still think, you know, anytime there's a moment that the media can jump on some kind of cat fight between older women and young women, they'll do it. I was going to ask you, you mentioned fat shaming. Actually, that was going to be where my next question went is, you know, is there a way for us to make common cause between the fat liberation movement and the disability justice movement and the, um, and the aging, you know, the gray power movement? Like, to me, those things are all sort of located on the body in ways that mm -hmm. might, might inform one another. And so I'm just wondering, you know, what lessons we could learn from those three spaces. That's a great question. And I really have to confess that I haven't thought about that enough, you know, about how those alliances um, might be forged. But it's a great point, ER. And, um, uh, you know, when I should um, put my thinking cap on about, it's a great point because you're totally right. The intersections are so obvious. I mean, I was just thinking so much about, you know, what you were saying about drug companies just pushing, pushing, pushing. And you even notice it now that I'm home during the day. It's like watching network television during the day, you know, even during the news. It's like nonstop drug ads because they assume that it's older people who are at home watching TV. Right. And it's that medical model, which extends. I mean, even in the way that we're talking about COVID right now, I'm a diabetic. And so I'm like looking at the list of everything. And then I see obesity is listed as a, you know, like, you know, class three obesity, which is a totally made up thing, right? Like that's not even a real, that's a social construct, right? Um, but they are putting that next to type one diabetes, which is what I have. And I'm like, that's, that's, you know, as we're thinking about these things that, you know, people over 65, people with these chronic health conditions, and then, you know, fat people are all being lumped together to, to, you know, to be sequestered and all these things, it, it, it's bringing up a lot of questions for me about how we can all um, fight back against notions of disposability, especially like, particularly in the early uh, discourse around COVID, people were like, well, if you're young and healthy, you'll be fine. So don't worry about it, right? As if all, all older people um, and all people with chronic illnesses were just like, not that important. Um, so that's just been on my mind a lot. And I think because you, you brought up the, the the medical ads, especially, I was wondering kind of what, how you had been thinking about it. Well, um, on the one hand, you know, when this hideous, you know, virus descended upon the world, uh, you know, the first warnings were, oh my God, people over 65, you know, Go hide and don't come out. You're the most vulnerable. You're the most susceptible to this and so on and so forth. Um, now, on the one hand, um, it is true that uh, people's immune systems are not as robust when they're 65 as they were when they're 25, right? But it was such a natural default to equate being older with being the most vulnerable, the most fragile. Um, the most weak, total default. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, in our state, 48% of the, um, you know, cases of COVID are between people, are among people who are between uh, 30 and 59, 48%. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have this horrible version of it afflicting little kids. Yeah. Um, the of the people I know who've gotten it, two of my closest friends who've gotten it, both thirty years old. Um, we don't. There's so much we don't know about this horrible thing. Um, but it was like you're right. I mean, on the one hand, did anybody say, "Oh, African Americans on the front lines, you guys be careful"? No, nobody said that. And look who's, look who's dying from this, you know? It's care workers, it's bus drivers, it's people working in groceries. You know, in Michigan here, it's like, you know, 70% of these people are women and 
and you know of care workers and etc they're women of color 12 percent of them live in poverty uh, I'm sorry, 23% of them live in poverty, 12% of them don't have health insurance. So all of these kinds of equations that emerged out of this, is, as you rightly point out, um, you know, and then you have these, you know, 20 somethings out on the beach in Florida saying, oh, I'm not gonna get it, you know? Well, yeah, sorry, turned out you did. So yeah. there was an, there were these pre-existing models of vulnerability onto which this initially mapped that were then deeply complicated. Yeah. So I have two more questions for you. One for me and one from um, from our uh, viewers at home. Um, I, so often I get stuck in trying to sort out which 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 things come from the patriarchy and which things come from capitalism. Uh, you know, it's like, and and maybe that's a useless exercise. But as you were talking about a lot of the things that older women are facing, the beauty industry um you know sephora kind of stuff and the even the way that people are talking about like oh god when i you know i haven't been able to color my hair uh since covid happened and like you, you know my gray is going to be showing all these kinds of things are coming out or i haven't been able to go get my anti-aging serum uh you know because i've been at home like I'm, I'm seeing all these things on social media so to me that's about patriarchy but it's also very much about capitalism pushing these solutions on us about you know you should you should feel ugly um as you age you know there's something wrong with you for doing this thing as you rightly point out is uh inevitable and uh ineluctable and so i wonder do you have a, an opinion as to whether or not those things are uh in any way if it's even useful to try to separate those things out or if they're just like a, a hydra that we need to fight at the same time it is totally not useful um because we live in patriarchal capitalism right, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? It's this yeah. interwoven thing. You can't separate, you know, one boosts the other. They're like, it's a, it's a thing. Um, patriarchal capitalism. So, okay. Uh, patriarchy might say, you're an older woman, you've got wrinkles, you've got puppet lines, you know, all this shit they tell us. Um, and you need, you know, and you're ugly. Patriarchy says that. But capitalism says, so you got to buy oil of Olay or you got to buy this thing that cost you know eighty five dollars for a container this big. They're totally interwoven. Interwoven. You can't separate them. Yeah, that's that is what I definitely uh, think too. So our last question um, is, to end on a hopeful note: Can you share a story or two of women today who are re reinventing the road ahead? And that's from Barry Love. Um, you know. Um, I wrote about some of these women at, in the end of uh, my book, and I can't retrieve all of their names, but um, I would say that I find women like um, Nancy Pelosi and Maxine Waters incredibly inspiring. Um, even though she's a gorgeous celebrity, I find Jane Fonda really inspiring. You know, this is a woman who's going out every Friday, you're right, and getting arrested. Um, to object to um, the inaction on climate change. Um, so there are um, Helen Mirren, <laughs> again, a gorgeous, famous celebrity, who's the face of L'Oreal. And she goes into like this, you know, giant, you know, uh, meeting um, to celebrate L'Oreal products. And um, I will seek not to use the expletive that she used, but, but she says this in front of everybody, everybody, including all the L'Oreal guys. She said, I know it doesn't do F all for my face, but you know, it makes me feel better. So, <laughs> you know, so there are women like that, but there are older women um, who are in their sixties and seventies who are university professors who are biological scientists, who are working at NASA, um, who are uh, journalists and writers. Um, it's your friend who's an, an activist and organizer in your religious organization. It's your mother's aunt who inspires you. It's your mother. I mean, you know, there are so many 
women out there, famous and not, who are just keeping on, keeping on, and they're working, they're volunteering, um, they're pouring their hearts and souls into their families right now, um, and they're pouring their hearts and souls into politics because they do not like what they're seeing, and um, uh, and they want to reactivate their own legacy from the 70s and 80s about social justice. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great place to end. Um, I have really enjoyed this conversation and I think our, our folks in the comments have too. We're really grateful to all of you for um, being with us at home. I hope that you will please purchase in our prime. There's a button right at the bottom of your screen where you can do that right now. And no matter where you are in the world, we'll send it to you. Um, it is also my, uh, my duty and my honor to ask uh, for you to consider donating to our nonprofit. So our nonprofit Kara Circle is individually donor funded. That's how we do all of these events. And it really helps, um, you know, any, any amount helps us keep doing this work through the pandemic. Um, and we really wanna be able to bring this important programming and also support our authors who, you know, this is a hard time to be launching a book. Um, it's not ideal, <laughs> but uh, we are really glad that um, we have this format that we are able to talk to one another and gather um, and we hope that you'll take take what you learn in this program and go out in the world and let folks know how important this book is. Um, tell your friends to read this book. And if there's anybody um, that you think would enjoy this event, you can immediately after this event, share the link that you use to get here. So if you got friends on the West Coast who are just getting off work or whatever, send them the link so that they can watch this conversation. And if you have any friends who are deaf or hard of hearing, in a couple of weeks, we'll have the... Um, event up with the closed captions so that it'll be accessible in that way. Um, but thank you, Susan. This was a wonderful discussion. We're very grateful for all of your work, all of your books. I was telling Susan that I um, used her books in college. So it's really a pleasure um, to get to meet you face to face through this medium. And uh, great to have you all on this conversation. Well, you too. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this. And um, thanks to everybody who tuned in and um, uh, I hope you enjoyed the conversation and I had a great time. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Be safe and be healthy. Uh, and uh, until next time, um, be, be well. All right. Take care.